Africa. I'm going to title this Delocalizing Home for East Africa Indians. And I start with a quotation from a historian of South Asia. David Ludden says, human experience moves in spaces that we grossly distort by merely drawing roots of trade, migration, and cultural flows among territories defined only by national maps. My interest in India and East Africa began in graduate school when I took a course on East African history. Reading about East Africa's cosmopolitan urban centers and colonial past, I learned about the history of the indentured uh, labor. And though I agree um, with the ambassador that it is a certainly pejorative way of talking about it from the British perspective, it was seen and described and, and written about certainly as a system of indenture. And uh, the labor, the Indian labor that built the Uganda Railway. What struck me, however, was that the connection between Western India and Eastern Africa far predated the European colonial priorities and the um, Indian labor importation. So rather than this triangulated relationship that was being portrayed about India, Britain, and Africa, I was drawn to the independent histories of the movement of goods, people, and ideas across the Northwestern Indian Ocean. The British did not have to be part of the narrative. And at the time that suited me just fine. Until, of course, there comes such a time when they must be included. So with this growing academic and popular interest in contemporary migration and diaspora studies, I began to do the work to deterritorialize de Indian history writing. Much of the Indian history that takes place outside of its national boundaries is often left out of the historical record. So my work focuses on the multiple and circular migrations of Gujarati families in East Africa and aims to expand the historical geography of India. Families are not in place, they move circularly and they bring institutions, policies, capital, ideas, and histories with them. The notion of home too is unfixed and multiple and, and is characterized by what can be described as the dialectics of longing and belonging. East Africa and India, therefore, become lands active with family life, commercial pursuits, and political stakes, even when the historical record does not consistently include those overseas in the national imagining, imagination. For this talk, I will summarize um, some of the research on two particular groups. One, the rags to riches stories of late 19th and early 20th century Gujaratis who, like the family of Nanji Kalidas Mehta, ended up making a fortune in India. And two, repatriated Uganda Indians, those who returned to India in the early 1970s following the government of India's resettlement scheme for Uganda Indian refugees. And I'll end with a few words about a third group, those expelled in 1972 who returned to Uganda after the government of Uganda's 1983 and 1992 repossession schemes. What I present here is based on research I conducted in Ahmedabad, Porbandar, Mumbai, and Kampala. Standard narratives about India and East Africa often are told from the site of settlement, the site of arrival, and that Indians get subsumed into the history of that place. Colonial and post-colonial complexities have been circumvented or rendered absent by particular selections of the historical record. Those selections have not aligned Kampala with Porbandar or Mombasa with Ahmedabad, but rather have conceptualized migrants as either in or out of a territorialized nation state. Such oversimplifications mask the facts of history. While Western India and Eastern Africa have been part of the geo-commercial frame centuries before Europeans were navigating the Indian Ocean, perhaps millennia, we could argue, the more recent historical evidence about Indians in Uganda provide ways to trace and complicate what has been called transnationalism or translocalities. Indians are making place through their shifting geopolitical environments. They remap the cultural, religious, economic, and regional identities of Gujarat or Punjab to Uganda or Kenya. Their diasporic life histories, even when disrupted by expulsion, place Kampala and Ahmedabad, for example, into one frame. Thus, rethinking the historical geography of India in this way makes Western India's overseas constituents central rather than ma marginal to discussions about Indian history and the politics of region and nationalized identities. This unique refugee repatriate status presents a historically unusual phenomenon and exemplifies multiple themes of transnationality. They are movement of capital, a bifold consciousness of trauma and desire, and an unremitting alignment of localities. So first, the family migration history of Nanji Kalidas Mehta. His family's life, his family's migration history is one that I've called Uganda sugar cementing India. Leaving from the port of Porbandar to Bombay and then to Mombasa on a 26-day journey on a wooden-based sailboat, 
made the in Africa in 1901. Porbandar has a long history of being one of Western India's most active port towns. And while Porbandar no longer enjoys that extensive port traffic it once did, its commercial activity and societal vibrancy today tend to be the direct result of the Mehta family's investment in that city. He grew up in a groundnut farming community and viewed Africa, quote, not as a safari for tourists, but a land of commercial enterprise and youthful adventure, close quote. In the first decade uh, in East Africa, he established credit with area merchants, opened his, and then eventually opened his own shops. Earnings from these small dukas shops, interestingly, there's a very lively debate in so among sociolinguists about the origins of that word, if it's Swahili, if it's Hindi. I always assumed it was a version of dukan, but sociolinguists have other ideas about that. In any case, the dukas enabled Mehta to accumulate capital needed to establish credit and experiment with larger industry. So he entered the cotton trade. Writing to family in Gujarat, requesting cotton seeds and other raw materials, he was able to grow the business steadily. He invested in, uh, he invested his earnings and um, from selling imported goods from Bombay into new business ventures in East Africa and then later India. Like elsewhere in the Indian diaspora, the world's largest according to the UN Population Division, kinship networks became business networks. Notable figures such as Homi Mehta and Ambalal Sarabhai bought Indian capital to East Africa and founded Jinneries on partnerships with Mehtas in the 1920s. Mehta's enterprise grew beyond cotton mills to sugar and tea estates. The Mehta Group of Industries, of which the Sugar Corporation of Uganda is a major component, as well as Mehta's descendants, are the inheritors of mobile and fluid transnational identities and global economies that began centuries ago. My small fun fact for the day is that his grandson, Jay Mehta, is married to former Miss India Hindi film star Juhi Chawla, and he is the co-owner with Shah Rukh Khan of the Kolkata cricket team. Fun fact for my day. <laughs> Mehta contributed immensely to the growth of East African economies, but he was also systematically involved in Indian affairs. One of the most symbolic contributions was his purchase of a Porbandar building in which Gandhi was born. Present day Indian maps mark Porbandar as a place of tourist importance solely for the existence of this privately created Gandhi landmark. In East Africa, Mehta had, Mehta had read about Gandhi's struggles for rights in South Africa and for independence in India, and eventually Mehta fund, helped to fund Gandhi's activities. They first met in 1915 during Mehta's visit to India. Mehta hosted a political event such as the fourth Katiawar political conference for the state, which was held in the grounds of his Maharana Mills in Porbandar. For Mehta, there was a seamless relationship for what he believed was good for Porbandar, for India, and for Indians in East Africa. He, uh, he, he first had the idea to enshrine Gandhi's Porbandar birthplace when he hosted Gandhi in 1944. His resolve escalated after hearing a South African education minister remark, quote, Indians seem to be in the dark of the value of the greatness Gandhi possesses. Had there been any country in your place, it would have built an inspiring memorial near this place and preserved the old house for posterity to visit and derive inspiration from, close quote. Kirti Mandar now stands in Porbandar and serves as a historic landmark commemorating Gandhi as the pride of the city and perhaps the sole object of its tourism, but also as tribute to the city's primary benefactor and unofficial Bapuji, Nanji Kalidas Mehta. Mehta connected people, capital, and governments in ways that could not be easily reversed and in ways that were not prompted by British imperial initiatives. He built Saurashtra's first textile mill, later a hydrogen plant, and eventually a cement factory on the outskirts of Porbandar. And it still exists today as a technologically sophisticated player in India's cement production and distribution industry with its Hathi Cement Company, for example. The multiple and circular migrations of many Gujarati families in East Africa offer new ways of conceptualizing place and those who inhabit those places. I'd like to now turn our attention to the expelled Ugandans of 1972, part two of my talk. These understudied refugees returned to India in the early 1970s following the government of India's resettlement scheme for refugees. These refugees and the two Ahmedabad neighborhoods in which they live mark the legacy of post-independence displa displacements that started as the British imperial landscape waned and the Ugandan independence was gained. Like in Porbandar, Refugees Ahmedabad is a city whose demographic make makeup is directly linked to sites on the other side of the northern Indian Ocean. 
For a historian like me, however, Kampala functions like a neighboring city to Ahmedabad. Two neighborhoods, one history. In August of 72, President Amin set the deadline for his initial expulsion of Indians who were not Ugandan citizens. The New York Times described India's decision to send an envoy as a reaction to worldwide agitations about the expulsion order. Since until this time, the Indian government had been largely indifferent to the plight of Indians in Uganda. Journalists and many scholars alike represented the government of India's position as one that viewed the problem as a British one. British passport holders, British problem. Expelled Indians were being turned away from London too, however, in part due to Britain's 1960 Act that restricted immigration pay based on birth and parental birth or naturalization. This was well captured by the New York Times 1972 headline, Asians go home, but where is home? It's in this context of home that I represent, that I present two neighborhoods in Ahmedabad, Uganda Society and Uganda Park. Not far from the renowned IIM is a cooperative housing society comprised of approximately 86 bungalows named Uganda Society. In 1974, a handful of Gujarati refugee, sorry, Ugandan refugees carrying British passports who had not initially received funding from the um, assistance from the government of India to resettle, made a plea to purchase land and develop this housing society for refugees. Their plan specified that the society's members would have to be British passport holding Uganda Indian refugees. Using the same personal and business networks that they had established over years of conducting business in, with Ahmedabad, this rather entrepreneurial group secured assistance from Gujarat's chief minister. And the reason for returning to India rather than going to Britain, they stated, was that India is home. Members of Uganda society distinguished their housing society from Maninagar's Uganda Park based on citizenship. In their articulations of difference, however, socioeconomic status appears to be salient. Those who maintained their Indian citizenship were represented as being from a more working class, lower skilled professional service fields in Uganda. Mame Nagar's Uganda society recollect their own neighborhood as a collective development scheme while they represent Money Nuggers Uganda Park as a government assistance program. Such tensions serve to distance these two communities despite a shared historical narrative. That narrative is one of expulsion, trauma, displacement, and loss of home. Yet a wise Uganda Park resident reminded me that what I might hear from some of the residents of Uganda society, the collective investment scheme, I needed to know what was most important. Expulsion is expulsion. In the eyes of the Gujarat and Indian governments, he speculated, there was no difference between the two. So even though expulsion may be expulsion, home is not home. Expelled Indians who carried British and Indian passports did not mobilize themselves around any common identifier or shared predicament, but rather independently developed their new home from home a twice displaced home, a Gujarat to Uganda and then back again. So uh, some concluding thoughts. The story does not end with the 1970 repatriations back to India. Large number of Indians uh, resettled in Great Britain and Canada and all around the world. An epilogue to the story of those who were once expelled and then later returned to Uganda in the 1990s after the Uganda government's repossession schemes and policies. Additionally, there's a new generation of migrants who came directly from India to Uganda in the 1990s, enticed by President Museveni's business incentives and with no expulsion passed. The post-1972 and post-1990s predicaments of migration, forced out then welcome back, punctuate a century of migration, memories, remittances, and reintegration. History writing depends on such vestiges of limited imaginations have been left out of places of origin, Porbandar, places of repatriation, Amdabad, and the individual lives of migrant families who move locations and change the social landscape of multiple places. Like the migrants themselves, those of us who want to know more need to crisscross places of experience and inquiry. Translocal histories trace how individuals remap places and provide insights into ways in which individuals understand themselves and how histories about them are created in a changing, mobile, colonial, post-colonial, and now post-post-colonial world order.